Good evening. Hello, good morning, wherever you are. Welcome to the Real Business of Wine webcast. And today we're looking at branding and specifically Italian wine. And one of the biggest questions in wine very often is, what is a brand? Do we have wine brands? And a lot of the people that I know and speak to say, oh, no, wine isn't, I don't like brands. Oh, I like producers, I like regions, I like estates and so on. And you say, but how do you define a brand? And there's often this feeling that a brand has to be something made in millions of cases uh, and sold in, in, in at low price. And I say, well, is Romani Conti a brand? And they go, well, yes, okay. So that's, we're looking at brands in the broadest sense but looking at it very specifically in Italy, and we have a panel with three different producers, um, Roberto Bava um, from the north, I'm going geographically, Roberto Bava from the northwest of Italy uh, with a range of wines, particularly Barbera, which is a speciality, but also a range of other wines, including a number of innovative wines we'll be hearing about. Going, to the, 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 going across to the east, we have Marilisa Allegrini, who of course is in the world of Valpolicella, but also in Tuscany with two different regions. Uh, and how do we look at those? How do we market brands and regions separately? And we have Jose Rallo, who's in, from Donna Fogata down in Sicily. So we, we've actually got the, the top, the middle and the south. Uh, but people actually living in the north and in the south. And then the last person on my panel, but certainly not least, um, a very long-term friend of mine, I won't say old friend, David Gleave, Master of Wine, um, Canadian-born, Italian specialist, but importer of wines from, from just about everywhere with wines from Australia and New Zealand and has a vineyard in New Zealand, but very much a specialist on Italian wine from all the time I've known him. And so um, with, a, with a business based in the UK, which is around 50-50 restaurants, retail, go, go up and down, I think, but roughly. Um, yeah, I guess I'll unmute you, but I think that's it. So what I'd like to do, and sorry, and, and lastly, but uh, hopefully those of you who watch this regularly, Polly Hammond, my partner in crime on all of these sessions, um, who's gonna be in the background with me. So I'd like actually just, um, I will be, uh, impolite and I will start with David as a, as a man actually just because you're dealing with wine from the whole of Italy how do you see um, branding Italy and branding producers in Italy uh, in terms of you as a distributor I think I mean you know one of the great things that Italy has is 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 um, another brand which is Italian food Italian restaurants I think that has has helped um, Italian wine tremendously. And then there's that famous, you know, made in Italy. Um, I think Italy has managed to, as a country over the last 50 years, create an amazing um, image for itself. And I think um, Italian wine um, is, is now very much part of that. Um, you know, I'm old enough to remember when it was difficult to sell um, premium Italian wines. Um, and I think, you know, now, um, there's, it's, it, it's so much easier. Um, and I think that's down to any number of factors, but it's certainly being part of made in Italy. Um, and it's also part of the, um, I think, you know, the, the Italians aren't necessarily known for working together very well. And yet I think that they have as, as creating brand Italy for wine, the best producers have done that by working informally. Um, on, on how they promote their wines. So I think um, Italy is probably, you know, of all the European countries, the best at doing that, in my view. And I think that's helped promote and create this brand Italy. And I think perhaps we, we started this project of Real Business of Wine uh, right at the beginning when Provine didn't happen, but we were talking then about whether Vin Italy would happen. And we had Stevie Kim of Vin Italy on the panel there. And you do have in Italy as, a, as an extraordinary annual event, or have, apart from this year, had it as a, as a way that pulls um, everything together. And one of the biggest and best stands uh, that I go to um, every time there is the Allegrini stand, which um, has plants growing on the outside of it, at least it did um, last year or the year before last. Marisa, talk to me a little bit about how you uh, brand everything you do, because it's, it's more than just the, the wines from your own region, isn't it? 
Yes. Okay. I, yeah. Hold on. So, I think that uh, to build a brand is uh, not an easy task. And the first thing that is that uh, you have to start uh, from the real wineries. There are many brands that the winery that is, doesn't exist uh, now. And you see many wines on the shelves uh, and then you look for the connection with the winery and there is no winery. So uh, for me, the thing is to start uh, with the, a real company, with the winery and especially with vineyards. And to build a brand is, uh, as I said, is difficult because uh, uh, my experience is that uh, I started in 1983 after my, I took over from my father, who was also connected with the family business. I started traveling, I started uh, uh, let people to taste the wine, I started to talk about uh, the family business, I started what uh, we call the storytelling. Now storytelling is very important and when I discovered the word I said to myself, oh, but this is what I've been doing for 35 years now. And then uh, at one point you understand that uh, uh, living in a country like Italy, producing wine from uh, local uh, areas, uh, so with a variety of uh, grape variety and uh, different grape variety and variety of food that we have, uh, but also to put uh, our products inside a cultural context, uh, history, uh, you know that we are the country of the Renaissance, so we have a lot of beautiful uh, uh, monuments. So for me to build a brand is to put uh, all this value and all this element uh, together. So the product, the quality, the, uh, the surrounding uh, vineyards, uh, the art, uh, etc. And as uh, David very well said, the ambassador for the Italian wine production was, uh, are and will be our restaurant around the world. The restaurant that really believe in the uh, quality and in the diversity that we have also in terms of food. So we have to be very grateful to them. And when I look for um, how I consider a country successful for the distribution that uh, I have, I need, uh, I think that we need to have visibility, so we need to be visible in the wine list, and also we have to have a very good balance uh, on the shelves, uh, so on the retail. This is what makes me uh, the concept of branding. Thank, thank you, Marilisa. I'm going to move to Roberto Bava for one reason, which is that I travel, well, until recently I've been traveling far too much. And Roberto is one of the, the people I know who, who travels even more than I do. And I, Roberto is in Vietnam or India or China or whatever. And I'd like to pick up on what Marilisa was talking about in terms of Italian culture. Because when you're going to all these countries, do they all see Italian culture in the same way? Um, well, traveling, yes, but not no more that much, uh, of course. Um, we um, we have this made in Italy, uh, which was built uh, even more than uh, by wine producer to the fashion system, to the food system. Uh, so this was built uh, before we even arrived uh, selling wine, which is a, a great help. Uh, actually, David was was right. Made in Italy is a big brand generical big brand. Not everybody can uh, have these on the back. Uh, not everybody has, uh, has Italy on the backs, but you can build a brand in any way. Uh, what could be uh, an opportunity sometimes uh, can also be uh, a problem in a way. Uh, if we have to define uh, the Italian world of wine, you would name uh, the Byzantine complexity. Uh, if you start from a new uh, wine producer, uh, let's call wine, new wine like Australia, it's quite easier because you go to simple concept, uh, consistency maybe, but easy. I mean, we have to deal with uh, uh, 
the appellation system. We have to, to, to live with uh, being uh, seated on, uh, I don't remember how many grape uh, uh, varietal, native varietal, maybe 400. I mean, in Piemont itself, we have 200 uh, as like uh, uh, the total of France. Um, so the first uh, uh, step is keep this uh, message understandable. Other way, people is scared. Uh, marketing may help. On the other side, what seems to be Byzantine, it's also a great opportunity. Because uh, if you want to build a loan brand, I mean, I want to build my Bava name, etc. But um, at the very end, I needed the help of my colleagues. Uh, I can't do it alone worldwide. Uh, I need to have uh, colleagues helping me to build Barbera. So let's build Barbera, let's build Barolo. Then it would be easier to say, oh yes, you know Barolo, but maybe that uh, Bava is one of the good ones. So uh, what I understood is when I'm alone, uh, it's so difficult. The, big, the world is too big. Um, I had a few experiences recently. Recently, I mean 10 years. Uh, with a few appellations, and uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about Nizza. Nizza is the new appellation of Barbera, super Barbera. Um, and it's just next to Barolo, two different world of, and two different way of building a brand. Uh, Nizza is, uh, is building a story on one of the oldest, and they used to be boring uh, grape like Barbera. But it's not, it's not being built today with uh, uh, money. It's built by the system of producer, which for some reason, feel friends and work together. They don't spend that much money, but we are running all over to say, hey, there's a new Barbera, it's Nizza. So alone, I couldn't do it. I'm one of the old producers of Nizza, but in the same time, I have uh, uh, energy brought around the world with my friends. So appellation can prove to be useful on the long run. At the beginning, in the 70s, we didn't understand it's a law, we don't like the law in Italy, but on the long run, it make it clear what we are offering to the consumer. And, and then building together. So that's the easiest way, uh, starting from a complex world. Thank you, Roberto. And you've given me the perfect way to move down to Sicily. Because, firstly, I'm old enough to remember when Sicily was not high on everyone's list and when Etna was a, was a, a, a geographical uh, piece of scenery rather than a place associated with, with great wine. Um, there were producers, of course there were producers, not very many of them, and Donna Fogato was one of the pioneering producers of Sicily. But Sicily is, is one of the regions of the world that has really leapt um, into the, the, the front row. And my, the reason why I think it's fascinating to move to you next, in a way, is are we talking, when we're talking about Donna Fogata, you are a Sicilian winery and you're an Italian winery and you're Donna Fogata. What sort of order of importance uh, is there for you? Huh. Uh, uh, you, 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 tell, you told the story of Sicily and uh, in very brief words, it's right. Probably 30, 40 years ago, Sicily was unknown as a wine region, was not so well accepted uh, as a wine region. Today, Sicily, after 30, 40 years of uh, uh, brand building, of uh, working as a team, we are making curiosity. We, are, we have demonstrated the great potential of this territory. Um, I think that uh, when I started, I had to say I was Italian more than I am Sicilian. Because 30 years ago, the people would have not even listened to me if I was saying I am Sicilian. So I was saying I am Donna Fugata. And people was asking, what's Donna Fugata? And I, I could not even say Donna Fugata is Nero Davola or Grillo or uh, because they didn't know. 
So I had to say, Donna Fugada is an escaping woman. An escaping woman? Are you a winery or what? <laughs> oh, yes, I'm a winery, but I'm a novel in the same time. I'm one of the most famous Italian and Sicilian novel, uh, well known and translated in the world, The Leopard. Oh, wow, you are the leopard. You are the woman in flight. So my parents started to build the brand on emotion, on suggestion. Uh, this was important to, you know, to overwhelm all the prejudgments we were facing on the market. So we had people dream something. We could not really tell, as uh, Marilisa told before, we have vineyards, we have winery. They didn't listen to that. They couldn't think that Sicily had vineyards and winery and quality wine. So we had people dream. Uh, dreaming with their fantasy. What is this woman doing? Where is this woman going? What is this mystery protagonist of a novel of, uh, no, so we were um, building this, this storytelling about this fantastic female protagonist. And, and this became a name, the name of the winery. This became a logo. This woman with the hair tossed in the wind, something that made curiosity. And then little by little, we demonstrated that we could produce quality. Quality was consistent. We both worked on native grapes and international grapes. So we could tell some very important values because I think that Brand is built on values and especially on sharing values. What are the values for the winery and what are the values that we can share with our wine lover? Authenticity, terroir, native grapes, craftsmanship. This is another important value for our wine lovers. Respect for environment. Okay, Sicily is more happy than other maybe terroir. We have sun all the year round. Happiness, friendliness. This is another value that Donna Fugara wanted to share with the wine lovers. We are colorful. We, are, we have pleasant but rich and complex wines. So we want to share friendliness, happiness to drink together, to stay together. And uh, this is the way my parents and my brother and I built the brand since the beginning, 1983 till now. Thank you. Can I go back to one of the things that's fascinating, and I think it's thing I always think about Italy and you're, you're, you're all exemplifying it, is how you have wonderful producers like you who take your brands, your personalities uh, to, the, to the outside world. And maybe you do it better than uh, some other countries I can think of. But ultimately, uh, for a lot of the time, or most of the time, your brand is in the hands of your distributors and others. And Marilisa, um, you're a fascinating situation in the sense of being a family winery, a, a very old established family winery, distributed by another family business, but rather a larger family business in the US in the shape of Gallo. How do you ensure that your, your brand, the, the Allegrini brand, is actually uh, transmitted uh, in, in the US and indeed in other markets? Uh, to answer your question, I think that uh, uh, what is uh, the key thing is uh, when you choose uh, a partner, in a market, it's very important that you share the same philosophy. It's important that you share the same values and it's important that you understand each other. And it doesn't 
mean that you have to choose the largest importer in a country. You have really to be very selective in the value that uh, you have. And I think that uh, with David, uh, when uh, we met, uh, it was a long, long time ago. Our kids were just uh, born and now they are 31. So you can imagine how long ago it was. We immediately understand that uh, uh, David was uh, capable to understand quality, to promote quality, to uh, be in, inside the company, inside our company, I mean. And uh, by this, uh, I uh, want to mention the fact that it's very important that not just uh, we visited uh, the markets and we promote uh, our wine, trying to explain what you do, trying to do to explain the value that we have, but it's very important that people come to visit us. And it's important uh, um, not only for visitors that visit the vineyard and uh, uh, do a tasting, but for example, what we do regularly with David at least uh, three times per year is that we go in the cellar, we taste uh, all the uh, the, bot the barrels and uh, we also listen to him and we listen to the people that understand wines. So I think that this is the best way to build a strong connection between producer and importers. And as I said, we have some market uh, where we have uh, uh, big importers, some mar market where we have the small importer, but uh, the key thing is uh, to understand uh, each other and to work very well. And for me, I've been traveling the world, uh, as I said, for a very long time, until uh, uh, 2000, the beginning of 2020, I was taking 150 flights uh, per year. So it's important that a company is capable to transmit the thing that you do at uh, your property. Holly, I think you've got a question. Yeah, um, so I'm quite curious about this because one of the issues we see working, you know, between Europe and the US is that the American model of branding, what Americans think about branding is this almost ostentatious, overblown shouting of their values. Um, how do you feel like the European sense of values compares to or combats with this American brand that we have now? Is anyone. a question for me or for anyone? Them? Anybody would like to answer? Anyone. That. Okay. <laughs> so, um, is a completely different approach to the market, but both have value. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Europe, in my opinion, is a little bit more sophisticated in terms of the knowledge of Italian and European wines in general, because uh, we've been uh, focused on uh, our European production for hundreds of years. In America, uh, is a kind of discover. And uh, the first market that I approached when I started traveling was United States. And uh, what I understood was uh, that you have to be very precise in the message that you have to give because they don't have time, they don't uh, listen to you for a very long time. But then there are different uh, kind of consumers and there are collectors that really want to know more and more about wine. And uh, we focus on this kind of, uh, uh, of people that we want to sell our wine. We know that uh, our uh, market in terms of uh, consumer is very small because you know they, we don't cover the mass market, but uh, we in saw an increased knowledge and an increased demand of good wines. And also they are more in the European approach in terms of quality. They want uh, to learn, they want to understand, and they want to uh, understand the native grape variety that we have. Holly, you've got more, um, I think. Yeah, so, so then what we have is a situation where we have to communicate a brand on multiple fronts. Uh, how do we handle that nowadays? Um, you know, I, I actually want to go out to the Donna Fogata team, and I know we've got quite a few of them in the attendee room, uh, attendee space as well. 
for how do we construct uh, and express the same values across multiple cultures and, um, and remain relevant to those cultures, but true to ourselves? Yeah, it's not so, so easy for a small size uh, winery like Dona Fugada, because if we compare to the size of other international and world brands, we're very small. So we have to be very smart to use our small uh, resources in a focused way. Um, I can say that the social time that we are living today are very useful because we can target our communication through the different uh, channels, through the different media. Uh, Twitter, for, for instance, is more uh, directed to professional press uh, um, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Facebook or Instagram can be also targeted on different age. So this is uh, easy for us to, um, to make a different communication to different target. But, but, but we must be prepared. We must be trained to do this. And I must tell you that even if we are small, we have a big staff. Uh, inside the winery, we have uh, focused people who are working on social media. We have uh, uh, suppliers who are uh, supporting us, uh, making strategy, and so, uh, and so. We are making investments to promote our communication because you know that nowadays you cannot throw a stone into the pond and solve your problem. You need to uh, support through ad advertising all the communication, all the most, all the messages, even if you are making the best content, the, the, the wonderful video, if you don't promote it, it's impossible that people uh, see you. Uh, so competition is really, really hard on social media nowadays. And it takes time, it takes skills, it takes money, but it's a big opportunity to speak a specific language to a specific target. Thank you for that. David, um, your annual tastings, or not your annual, your, your regular tastings are huge events. And there's a whole load of Australians over there and uh, French there and Italians. Do you, um, in terms of the number of producers you've got, do you discern differences of approach and attitude and philosophy between the countries and indeed even within the regions um, when, you're, when you're dealing with your producers in terms of branding. And back to my question of how many producers actually understand that they are their brands as well as being producers of great wine? Um, yeah, that's, it's a, a difficult question, but I think there, there, there definitely is. Um, you know, the Australians are pretty direct and you know this is our brand this is what we want and and, and there you go um you know the, the french um and i don't want to get into sort of national stereotypes but you know sometimes they they, they wonder why you know why you know but what do you mean you don't know anything about this you know but we are we are french i think you know i, I i've always said i think one of the things about italy um if you go back um a long time so, some people might remember the great adverts that Avis ran, which said, you know, um, when they were number two in the market. And they said, we're number two, so we try harder. And, you know, the market research that came out about that said, don't do it. Don't do it. It's terrible. And the CEO of the time said, no, we're going to do it. And it was a huge success. And that led Avis to overtake Hertz. Um, and I always thought that Italy is very much like that. You know, the, the Italians try harder. Um, they, and I think, you know, so coming back to branding, branding in Italy is multi-layered. And I think going back to Maria Lisa's question, you know, it's about having something of substance behind your brand. And all three of these producers here today do. And that thing of substance is very important. But that substance needs to be leveraged. And it can be leveraged in various ways. And I think, you know, part of that is the region you're in, you know. People go to Verona and they, they see Allegrini and they see the beauty of Valpolicella. They go to Piemonte 
to, to Nizza and they see the beauty of Nizza and, and the food and white truffles in the autumn and that's not a bad thing to help selling the wine. Um, you know, you go to Sicily and, you know, you've got Mediterranean's you know, largest island. You've got the capers from Pantelleria. You've got the mountain, the, the volcanic vineyards of, of Etna. So there's so much to touch there. And I think the Italians somehow, um, generally speaking, dig deeper and have more touch points to their brands than a lot of other countries. And they understand, as Marilisa said, that there is a, a connection to the place. Thank so, you, David. <laughs> that, that actually takes me back to Roberto in a way, because I think you, you, that touch point thing is fascinating. Because in, in a sense, it is the, the, again, Italy got into wine tourism uh, before France. Um, maybe not as, as early as California and other parts of the New World, but certainly before France did. And you, Roberto, you've, you've, I've known you in as getting into chocolate and getting into vermouth and getting into, into other things. It seems to me that Italians are given the leeway um, that the French and maybe some other countries don't take, uh, where people actually accept that Italians are more than winemakers. I don't know, maybe that's a personal view, but I'm just picking up on what you were saying, David. How do you see that, Roberto? Um, can I add one more variable to what David was saying? Mm. Um, the two ladies we have uh, uh, tonight from Italy are two war machines. Uh, <laughs> energy, energy is a very important variable. Uh, Giuseppe is one of my favorite singers. She sings so well. Ah, uh, uh, gosh. Uh, it's part of this. What does it work? I mean, it's singing. No, 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 no. Uh, anytime I think Donna Fugata, I, I listen to uh, uh, Jose uh, and she is phenomenal. Marilisa, I mean, she is a character. Everybody knows Marilisa in the world. Uh, let's give the quality for granted. Oh, okay, what is good, of course, but what's next? We are. 100,000 uh, good wine producers in Italy, but uh, why uh, uh, Allegrini is Allegrini, or potentially why Baba? But this is because we use all the variables we have. And yeah, you mentioned chocolate. Uh, I, I started uh, in, in the 80s to do something unusual, to do sensorial marketing. So we started to use music as well in a different way to, as, a, as a meta language to explain character of the wine. It was, now it's normal, but at the time I was taken like crazy. In the 90s, I, yeah, I used uh, chocolate. Why? Because chocolate is similar to wine. I could do a parallel, uh, et cetera, fermentation, varietal, origin, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what's next? I have a lot of next uh, story, but it's never only liquid. We sell ourselves and wine are the uh, expression of what we are. And again, we are Byzantine, going back to the same word. So we are never boring. That's a good uh, strategy, never boring. Because uh, if you wanted to tell about wine like, uh, oh, it's 88% water, 1% alcohol, a few milligrams of dry extract. So what? Why should I pay so much? You buy the story. You buy the voice of Jose. You buy my chocolate, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So again, we sell uh, to brains. We don't sell uh, to the stomach. This is what we have to understand, especially when we have a competition like uh, another million of wine producers. So let's build ourselves and then we'll build and sell the wine. That's a good point to start also. Okay, so far we've been celebrating um, and we've been saying how wonderful Italy is, but let's look at one or two markets. China has not been as great a success, I would say, for Italy as some people might have expected. The Italians, so the, the Chinese love ancient, they're loving Georgian ancient, uh, the, the story of Georgia and so on. But it seems to me, and they love tourism, but France seems to have won a lot of those battles. And Australia is winning some of those battles. Uh, what about those challenges of those emerging markets? Uh, if the question is to me. Well, uh, yes, if you'd like to. Yeah, others will pick it up after, please. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, uh, I've been in, uh, selling to China since uh, mid 90s. Uh, and it was clear that French were the leader 
and they were even teaching how to buy in French. Uh, it was not, li not only the way to drink, it was uh, the whole world was French based. Chapeau, uh, of course. Uh, but we had to enter being different. I don't know if quantity will ever bypass the French or even not the Australian at this point. But we had to express uh, uh, another way. And the way I used was again to sensorial, to approach with a different language, something they could understand. And it was food also, but you couldn't bring the spaghetti uh, uh, prototypes of what they expect uh, uh, iconic Italy, but uh, you had to approach their food, their way of talking, etc. So we found a situation which was hard because it was different and we couldn't use uh, the old ways to promote our wines. Still today, uh, it's a lot about the teaching. I was in Wuhan the day before they closed the, the, the town, by the way. And I, I was teaching to, uh, to the barman at that point. I was teaching the vermouth because uh, they need to know what is vermouth. So it was also a matter of being Don Quixote de la Mancha. Never get tired because you have to teach or the way you can sell because they don't know what to sell. So that's a good approach. Never get tired to teach because this is a big part of the product. Marilisa, we mentioned food because you're, you're also one of the great, A, you're a great entertainer. Your parties are, are famous. I've been lucky enough to, to, to have attended, but also um, you just love cooking and you cook for people all the time. How do you see the world? Because it seems to me America has been a great door opener for Italian wine. Which of the markets that for you are the most and actually the most challenging for, for, for Allegrini and indeed for Italian wine? Uh, I agree with the Roberto and I think that uh, the different type of cuisine do not uh, help uh, the distribution of the Italian wines because uh, in China they like their own food. So uh, what uh, was uh, so important for Italian wines, uh, all the restaurants that became the ambassador of our products uh, doesn't exist in China. And uh, uh, so it's a very challenging market. There are other markets where they love uh, their own food, for example, Japan, but is a combination of uh, Italian and uh, local food. And so uh, Japan is very successful. Korea is another example. So I really feel that uh, China is the most uh, challenging market in terms of distribution. And uh, I also went uh, to China the first time, I think it was 1999. And um, in 10, 15 years, uh, I realized that uh, the kind of distribution that we have uh, do not reach uh, the Chinese people, but it goes uh, to the uh, hotels because there is no Italian restaurant, but there are hotels, international hotels. Uh, and so most of our distrib distribution goes there. And uh, um, we have to keep uh, teaching them, but uh, I don't know. I think it's a very, very, very long uh, uh, way. And uh, uh, I'm not uh, positive that my generation will be able to be in the Chinese market. And uh, I think that uh, it will be the next generation because Italian wines are very difficult to understand. And uh, uh, for the Chinese, uh, they want the clear message, they want the easy message. And so I'm not very positive about the distribution that we can have in China. I know that they can learn fast, and uh, you know that Stevie is very helpful in this uh, with the Vinitaly International Academy. So we cross the finger that uh, some message will uh, get the right point and uh, so everything can be accelerated. But so far, I think that no single Italian winery has reached the success in China. That this was kind of, opinion. kind of behind my question. David, back, in, back to the UK, in the time that you've been working in wine here, has, has been, obviously the, the, the Super Tuscans preceded uh, both you and me, but, but we were both around and you were around to see them make a lot of noise for Italy, um, certainly in, in the 80s and, and 90s. Um, what's happening now in terms of 
grand Italy because we're beginning to see Van de France coming through from from France and some some uh, effectively the the, the the vino de tavola model seems to have been uh, adopted or beginning to be adopted by the French in their own way. Um, but there's also this kind of r return to regions in Italy, as I see it. How do you see that in terms of your distribution? I think you know, it's, it's interesting um, talking a bit about the uh, about China as well. Marilisa says that Italy is seen as being too complex. Um, and I think that was certainly the case in the UK. I can remember you know, 20, 25 years ago, people saying, oh, Italy's never going to boom in the UK because it's just too complicated. Um, and that's true, Italy didn't boom, but it grew gradually. And I think once people got into Italy, they weren't gonna get out again. So I think that, you know, that's what's happened. Italy has grown by people slowly becoming acquainted with it. Once they become acquainted with one wine or one region, it could have been the Super Tuscans at one point, you know, it might have been Amarone when the, when the boom happened for Amarone or Ripasso and brought new style consumers. Then Italy, people, um, you know, they go to other regions and there's so much diversity in Italy. Some people call it complexity, but, you know, you can call it diversity. And I think that that is helping Italy. So we now have an Italian wine scene, which, it's difficult to say it's a bit like Italian food. What is Italian food? You know, what you have in, in um, Marsala is going to be very different to what you have in Verona. And don't forget Verona is closer to London than it is to Marsala. Hmm. So, you know, it's, it's a very complex country. And it's the same for Italian wine. What is Italian wine? It is a, it's a collection of the wines from different regions and different native and indigenous grape varieties, which are um, endlessly fascinating. So I think that at the moment in the UK, the consumer is still going from region to region. There's been a lot of interest in the South and continued interest. There's a lot of interest at the moment in, in Piemonte um, um, and, and, in, and in Tuscany. So I think you, you know, it's, a, it's an evolving situation but one that's very focused on um, regional Italy and indigenous grape varieties. I'm going to move to, to Jose on my next question, because in, essentially when I think about China, uh, in an incredibly short time, we have seen, despite what I said about and what you were saying, Amarilisa, about China being challenging, I've seen China move from people ordering Lafitte and Petrus and um, anecdotally adding coke to it. I don't think that ever happened as much in public, certainly, as we heard about. But the fascinating thing is how quickly the Chinese have followed the Japanese model of the top, of the, the people with the money have moved into Burgundy and in Barolo and Brunello. For some reason, B seems to work very well here. Um, and now, instead of saying, I've got Lafitte, you say, I've got this Barolo from this producer. Um, and that the level of knowledge that I'm seeing amongst some Italians, some, some Chinese on Italian wine, it's extraordinary. However, where does that place you, Jose, as a Sicilian producer uh, in that context? And I'm not necessarily just talking about China, that may be true in other markets. No, 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 no. Uh, China is a good example to speak about different culture, because of course we are very different in the way we make business, in the way we, we eat, in the way we stay together. Um, I was so surprised uh, 20 years ago when I went the first time in Shanghai and at eight o'clock in the morning, I saw uh, staff making Tai Chi uh, on the street before going to work. So this is not very Italian style. We prefer cappuccino and cornetto in the morning, okay? But uh, I have a, a double uh, feeling speaking about China and country like China. I found very easy to pair my wine to their food. For instance, in Shanghai, I had a beautiful bottle of uh, Antilia, our most uh, uh, famous uh, um, white wine in the world. And I had a fantastic pairing with jellyfish. 
fantastic. I, I never thought about that. Fantastic. And a few days after, I had a fantastic glass of Berrier, our sweet wine, Pastito di Pantelleria, with a Beijing duck. Wow. And the Chinese were astonished, surprised, so enthusiastic about these potentialities no? of the pairing of the unique selling point, which is the best wine to pair to jellyfish, Donna Fugala white wine or to a Beijing duck. We had a problem with distribution. This is the real, the real matter. We started, as Marilisa said before, with the biggest importer in China, very reliable, very uh, under the point of view of the financial situation, very strong, half Chinese, half American, and so on. But they were too big for us. Now we have an Italian importer who is living in China since uh, 15 years and we are speaking the same language and distribution goes. So sometimes it's not a question of food pairing, it's not a question of culture, it's a question of distribution partner. So there are so many factors, so many elements, and they all must work together in the perfect way. Thank you. So I, I have a question about this um, because what I'm hearing is, a lot of a lot of message of we have to adapt as well you know we have to be open-minded we have to be willing to try the jellyfish and say okay how how is what we're producing working with a market that isn't native to us which is wonderful and adaptable but at the same time what i'm also hearing is the the tourism stories the hand selling stories how do we remain resilient in a time when restaurants are closing down, when key partners are having to develop new models, when the airplanes simply aren't running. What does the future of the Italian brand and the individual brands look like, um, you know, for say the next year, 18 months, and then who knows how long? And that's to anyone. <laughs> Roberto. Roberto is your goal. Uh, do you really believe I have the answer? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, I'm doing two or three scenarios. Uh, I, can't, I can't bring anything really uh, with a solution. I mean, I can tell you that uh, for sure I'm ready to have a longer vacation for floating and trying to survive for another while. Um, for now, the scenario is that uh, if we survive financially, etc., but we, we, we think we do, we are working to do it, there will be a, a growing back because uh, we'll start uh, from where we were with the new normality, but with the people, with the networking we have been uh, building. I, I find difficult to imagine that I will go to China to look for a new distributor uh, the day after. I mean, the day after I will go to my old friends and I was lucky enough to have a good uh, distributor. And, uh, and I will say, okay, we are back. Uh, it's now six months uh, later. Uh, where are we? Uh, we are resilient. Uh, Italian try to be, in a way, ready, in the Darwinian way, ready to, to change and to adapt, uh, probably more than, uh, than others, hopefully. And we start from them. I mean, if you have the solution, please let me know. Because uh, this is hard, but also everybody is in this connection, in this situation. So uh, it's not only us. Uh, if I'm sorry. If, I can, if I can add something, uh, what we're trying to do nowadays is uh, to continue working on the brand because we need to keep the brand alive, especially on social media. Stay with the people like we're doing now, staying with the wine lovers and speak to them, listen to them, stay with the clients. 
we have done a lot for our Italian clients, for instance, they are doing with the delivery and there are, you know, the restaurants now will be allowed to, um, to sell their dishes uh, just uh, uh, out of the, um, uh, of the door. And uh, I think that Italian will finally move into e-commerce and, uh, um, and to conversion. This is something that we don't really do very well at this moment. We are making a lot of brand awareness on the web, but we are not able to do conversion. I think that this is the real challenge of the moment to learn how to work on this channel, which will not uh, replace the restaurants that will start in a few months, but is a new channel. And people uh, have been practicing in these weeks and more and more they will deal uh, through the online buying. So I think that um, fitting ourselves on conversion strategies from social media to e-commerce is something uh, important and useful. What I want to say is that um, I think that uh, the first thing is that we have to be very compassionate to, to, to family that have big loss uh, and also for the people that lost their job because there are so many. And uh, I'm quite scared because uh, I think that is an unpredictable situation. It's something completely different from what we experienced in 2008. And uh, uh, on the positive side, agriculture has always been the part of the economy that at the end pay. So I'm very happy to be in the agricultural business. And uh, uh, on another point of view is that uh, science uh, will work. And I'm sure that sooner or later, uh, science will find the vaccine and will find the care for this uh, disease. But uh, poverty is another very big thing that can kill many people. So we have to be all together to go against this. And so we have to support uh, our employees. Uh, we have to, we have really to feel together and to, uh, understand that together we can go to, uh, we can make a better world. I know that is seem to be something uh, very idealistic, but uh, I really believe that uh, this is the right way that we have to move. I think that the, the fascinating thing about Italy, uh, maybe more than, um, obviously in Europe, wine has always been part of the, the life of the wine producing countries. But I always think it's, it's even more so in Italy maybe than some of the other countries I go to in the sense that it's not just grand wines, it's the wine at lunchtime, it's the white wine out of the jug. Uh, it's just, it's the lubrication to me of life in Italy. Um, and that's one of the things that I've always, that's, that, that's always moved me um, in, in a way that I haven't necessarily seen even in Spain or, or even in France in the same way and certainly probably not in Germany. But also, I think maybe the, the family aspect, and I think this fascinating when I look at Italian wine, um, you don't have corporations. You have some very big companies, but they tend to be to have families involved. And having talked to families outside Italy, there's that question of when you're a family, you can look into the future because you have to. Uh, but also, you don't do crazy things in, 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 in the short term because you have those, those investments. And to me, maybe that's one of the secrets of Italy, that the, the brand of Italy is linked to family as much as to the wine and the place. But well, that's a personal view. I don't know how you feel. Uh, David, just because in terms of the people you deal with. I mean, I think, you know, we deal with a, a, a large number of family wineries um, and several cooperatives, which is a collection of, yeah, of, of you know, thousands of families. Um, and I think, you know, I think we've got to go back. I keep coming back to, to, to one of the things that Maria Lisa said that, you know, there's got to be something sub substantive uh, behind the brand. And if that's a family, then I think it's a, you know, it, it, you can see, you can touch it and you're aware of it and you can relate to it. And you can also see its history. But I think, you know, one thing that we haven't said today, one of the, you know, we talked a little bit about brand Italy for wine, but we've also got to think of the, the great 
work that was done by, I think, two people in particular for many, many years, Angelo Gaia and mm. Piero Antonori, who traveled and spoke and, and, and were incredibly ambassadorial. You know, yes, they were out to sell their own wines, but they were out to create an image for a fine Italian wine at a time when it wasn't, it wasn't easy for other producers to do it. They laid the, 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 the sort of the, the groundwork for other people to do that. And, you know, they were from families as well. And I think that the strength of that family, and it, it, it helped create the, you know, it, it, it's not too big a stretch to say it helped create the Italian wine family. Um, and, you know, all the producers, they, they, they're interrelated in, 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 because they're all working in wine in a way that somehow I don't see in a lot of other countries. There's, there's, yes, there's competition amongst producers in Italy, but I see it to a much greater extent in, in other countries. And I'm not trying to idealize Italy as well. I've been around it long enough to, to know that there are some sort of a few rivalries, but generally people put the interests of the country ahead of a lot of other things, which doesn't necessarily work in everyday life in Italy, but it does in mine. Well, thank you, David. I think it's a great way to wrap up. Just any last words, uh, Jose? I uh, just wanted to show you how I'm going to make my aperitif. I have a touch of sun of Sicily in my glass, and this is our barrier. So good luck to all of us, and thank you, thank you very much for being for being with us and for having invited us. Thank you, Jose. It's lovely branding, Marilisa. So Jose said that, that uh, names are very important, and she has a fantastic uh, uh, name, Donna Fugata. <laughs> And uh, I think that for a wine producer, also Allegrini is a very good name. <laughs> uh, Allegro come from happy. So uh, my father used to say, when you come to my winery, you, are, you come with your last name, but uh, when you go out, you are all a little bit Allegrini. <laughs> so Roberto, there's no, no challenge here for you. How do you finish that? No way. They, they won in any way. My great-grandfather was using that we sell wine because they remember our name. It's only four letters, Bava. Very easy. So it's four, but uh, this was my uh, photo marketing for my great-grandfather. <laughs> anyway, no, I want to thank you also to have uh, the both of you, uh, because uh, both David and you, you are the two clever brain and the two legend in the real marketing from England because England invented a lot of things including a lot of Italian wines <laughs> so thank you for bringing your brain uh, uh, and, and share with us thank well, you can I say thank you to all of you thank you David Jose Marilisa Roberto and Polly obviously my, my partner on this Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this. This has been a great chat. It's, I, I missed going to Vin Italy so much this, this year, and I normally go to Italy three or four times a year, and so far um, I've not had that chance. So this was like, for me, a moment in Italy with Italian friends, and with David, who's my a Canadian, British, Italian friend here, um, and, and with Polly. So thank you all very much. Stay safe come back. We'll, we'll have great things the rest of the week. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good night. Ciao, baby. Bye. Ciao. Ciao, Jose. Ciao. Ciao, Roberto. Ciao, Marisa. Ciao a tutti. Okay. Bye, Roberto. Bye. Bye. Bye.